for joining this multi-chain design space. All right, so we have a ton of speakers here. Awesome. Again, thanks so much for joining this multi-chain design space. Uh, we're joined by an awesome panel here of folks from uh, Helena of Noble. We've got Magnus of Skip Protocol. We've got John of Calypso, Saki joining us. Could be talking a bit about SOM, potentially some inner protocol. And uh, we've also got Anil of uh, the ByteBitch team that's building the Crabble loaning app. So awesome to have everyone here. Um, I'm just gonna kick this off maybe with, you know, stating that, you know, everyone on this call has in some way contributed to the state of the industry's interoperability. Um, you know, so a big applause for all those folks here working diligently to make that possible. Um, you know, if we look at the the uh, global market cap of this industry, it's I think teetering around 2.7 trillion, maybe more. It's uh, it's in constant flux, obviously, but it's great. Um, you know, we put this space together because uh, you know what we're what we're seeing in the industry is 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 a much larger conversation and interest around how we actually build these multi-chain applications and and what does it actually mean to be multi-chain. Um, you know, both from, you know, how do we design applications and what's the infrastructure required um, to to actually make multi-chain applications a reality? And, and what's the benefit of being multi-chain? Why not just have apps on a single chain? Um, and so, you know, just a nod here that we, we, we posted a, an article called Five Multi-Chain App Designs on the Agoric blog. Um, we'll link that on this call later. Um, but, you know, we kind of explore some of those, some of those options and we'll be talking kind of loosely through those um, as kind of, you know, content buckets here to keep the conversation focused. Um, and, you know, for each of these general themes, we'll bring up a few speakers here who are uh, kind enough to spare us their time. Uh, you know, we'll maybe focus around 15 minutes, but of course, you know, if anyone who hasn't been specifically invited up to talk about this, uh, you know, one of these kind of, one of these categories, you know, you're totally free to jump up, raise your hand, come speak. Um, so we'll keep the things flowing, um, you know, and so, Again, I, I'd like to kind of maybe kick this off. Let's bring, um, see, I see we have John of uh, Calypso here. How's it going, John? Uh, and I'd love to bring up Magnus from, from Skip Protocol. Do we have you here, Magnus? How's it going? Yep, yeah, I'm here. How's it going, guys? <laughs> How's everything? Hey, hey. Good. Cool, cool. Yeah, so so I'd like to maybe start with, you know, covering this this idea of staking and swapping. Um, you know, I think at its core, it's, it's fundamentally maybe the, the most um, most common action users across the industry are gonna are gonna be doing, um, but you know uh, you know I'd love to hear maybe you know starting with you John kind of um, you know if you want to give an explanation of staking and swapping in general that's great um, but I, I'd love to kind of pick your brain around how you see you know the concepts of staking and swapping expanding into you know the multi chain design space and and what how we should maybe start thinking about staking and swapping differently when, when we start to introduce, you know, this kind of complexity to the system. Yeah. So I think, I think it's a, it's a, it's a conceptual change, right? So how people first, a lot of people, how they first learned about staking was, Oh, I just lock my asset up and I gain more yield of my asset. Then the conversation changed to what staking actually does. And, in providing security to a network and making sure that, you know, people don't actually do a hostile takeover of the network. And then now it's transitioning back to, oh, wait, I can get yield back on my asset. You know, it's kind of like that whole bell curve thing where it's the smart brain, dumb brain guy in the middle type of deal. Um, it's still providing security to the entire network, but I think it's going to go back to, oh, I can lock my assets up and get some more money for just letting someone hold on to it for me. Um, and that's essentially the basis of staking. So it, giving that passive investing principle, giving a lot of more people to access to it, I think that's the general trend of staking and that's what more people are going to trend towards. And then the swapping aspect, I mean, just swapping from one crypto asset to another and enabling easier swaps, you know, with Skip and similar just to, you know, enable an easier stake. Cool. So you have to swap to an asset to stake to it because you're probably not buying the first asset you buy is probably not the one you're staking. That's just the general flow. Um, but you know, those things tend to change over time. So that was just a quick little thing on it. Yeah. So, so maybe can you give a, a really high level of, of what you're doing in the space with Calypso um, and, and maybe how, how you from the Calypso perspective are looking at 
kind of cross-chain multi-chain staking and swapping? Yeah, sure. So Calypso, you can look at Calypso as enabling any cross-chain action to be completed with any token. So in the example of staking, um, and this is an example that we've given, you know, in person and online a lot. If you only owned an asset like Matic, but you wanted to stake into Osmosis, Calypso will automatically take your Matic for you, swap it to USDC, bridge that USDC over, swap to Osmosis and stake your Osmosis for you. So Calypso is essentially automating the multi-step processes to complete a cross-chain action. Um, and in this case, a cross-chain stake. Um, and there's obviously ways to, you know, improve it further and make it, you know, faster, including like noble CCTP and, you know, and decreasing costs and just making it a more efficient process. But the general process is just taking your one token that you own already and completing an action with another token. That's what Calypso is enabling. One way to think about that, or at least the way I think about it is for, for, chains themselves that want to increase the the rate of people staking on them you know what they find is say you know say you're you're um contributing to the osmosis chain and you want more osmo tokens staked the actual onboarding flow there is just really difficult you know user has to find multiple bridge front ends figure out which one and gives them the best price do a swap and if you're if you're not osmo if you're the cosmos hub then you've got another ibc transaction and and so you know, we know from Web2 that every time the user has to click additional times, the, you know, you lose some huge percentage of users just in drop off. And I, I think what we've done in crypto really is not just adding additional clicks, but adding a research project before each click. And so, you know, you really it, it becomes really hard to onboard new new people and get them, you know, working within your ecosystem or, you know, can, you know using those tokens to, you know, again, if you're Osmosis, maybe there's a perp dex that's launching that you want people working with. And, and so really the, the idea of easing that onboarding flow, I, I think that's, that's where Calypso and Skip, in my mind, sort of really, really help folks. And, and the staking and swapping is just a huge part of that. It's the first step to, to bringing people into the ecosystem. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. That, that's a good, yeah. I mean, what I get from that is it's, it's the, it's the, it's better UX fundamentally, right? It's, it's, it's the UX people are familiar with that they're comfortable with and they should probably come to expect. Um, Magnus, we, we have you on this call. I'd love to, you know, can you give a high level explanation of what, what skip protocol is, what it does and, and kind of your, uh, your take on this topic? Yeah, sure. Um, so skip is, uh, just mo mostly focused on building interoperability and, you know, native tooling to really help L1s thrive. Uh, Cosmos is the only ecosystem where we actually support the development of L1s and we encourage it, right? All other ecosystems are built on sort of this sort of like a hierarchical structure of rollups on top of rollups on top of data layers, et cetera. Um, and we want to make rollups like, or sorry, we want to make L1s extremely powerful. And so part of that is lowering like the barrier to entry for new chains, but then also users of those chains. And so the biggest thing there, I think, is just like the UX of, you know, of the interchain. Um, and a big part of that is, you know, sort of accommodating what you, what you call like, you know, the, the major use cases. So like the sending, the swapping, the staking at a level where users don't really have to uh, like essentially suffer through the, you know, isolated UXs of all these individual chains and can sort of have like a unified platform for doing these things. And also doing that in a way where it doesn't like take away the uniqueness or the, um, you know, exciting individual individuality of these individual chains and sort of like, you know, aggregating the parts that people want to be aggregated while leaving, you know, the parts that are specific to that chain, right? Um, and so for us, uh, you know, what we, what we built is sort of this, this interface IBC fund, which is essentially a all in one, you know, cross Cosmos, cross EVM, and now soon cross Solana uh, swapping and sending interface, where basically you can leverage this API to, you know, send tokens from any chain to any other chain or swap tokens from any chain to any other chain. Um, and you know, the, the API that powers that is what's available for every, for all other folks. And, you know, IBC fund is just an example, but we've seen people use it for all kinds of things like, you know, Stargaze that allows you to use any token 
on any chain to pay for a bad kid. Um, you know, it's obviously used in the in the MetaMask Snap uh, to to power swapping as well. Um, and you know, in the future, we're like we envision this world where it really doesn't matter where your assets are. Like, there's always going to be it's always going to be the case that people are going to want to hold different assets. Like, people will always want ETH or Osmo or Atom or you know, uh, like uh, the Agoric token. Um, but you know how they interface with that at a high level in terms of how they transfer those tokens around and you know, where those tokens are doesn't really matter to them, right? It doesn't really matter if that token that they have exposure to exists on one chain or another, right? Like that should all be abstracted away from the user. Um, and then the chains can focus on the stuff that like actually is specific to their application that's impossible to replicate, right? Like the individual use cases, um, you know, if it's an app chain, the actual application itself, like for example, the Perpetuals Exchange and DYDX. But for just like, getting money around and like having a portfolio view of where your money resides in our opinion that should really be abstracted and feel like you know uh feel like a very seamless user experience and i think so far we've had success with that like you know i think a lot of folks have realized this and been building towards that and the folks who have made major progress there including you know metamask snaps and kepler has also done this um they, they've seen a lot of success like people do like this vision of sort of like a unified interchain but then like going more deep into the individual applications once they're, you know, once they want to do so. And, and so what, what, what kind of functionality when you, when you mentioned the individual, individual applications, like what functionality are they adding on top of this kind of simplified, you know, asset UX, so to speak, like using IBC fun as an example, or, or maybe, maybe something else, but you know, where, what value are they getting from those individual applications? Yeah. So like, you know, if you're a chain and your only purpose is to print a token and like have it be staked and, you know, the only thing users are doing are swapping in and out of your token, like it's, you probably shouldn't have a chain, right? Like I think long-term that, I mean, unless you're the Cosmos hub um, where it works, but you know, long-term uh, that's, that's probably not sustainable. So, you know, I think what I, what I envision as like the future of Cosmos um, and where I think things are going is, Chains will get very good at doing specific things, right? Um, so like, you know, Agoric is, I, hopefully, I think, going to develop into being like one of the, you know, better development platforms for, for like, you know, people who want to build smart contracts in a really cool way with JavaScript and like have asynchronous callbacks and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, Osmosis is obviously specializing as like a DEX and DeFi hub. Uh, Stride is obviously specializing as like a liquid staking protocol. And like, these, these, are, these are applications on like a web, right? Um, they don't exist in isolation. They are essentially all, they, they can work together very closely, right? And the user, I think, of the web, just like a user will use, you know, many different websites, will want to be able to go and interoperate with these to, to use what they're best at doing, right? And, and to do that seamlessly and move their assets around. And so I think what I'm most excited about is like supporting really this idea of like, you can sort of add a unique value proposition to this web of chains. And then from the user perspective, it's very easy to get around this web, right? Almost like a browser and to transfer tokens from one chain to another to like use these new applications, to discover new applications and sort of have like their set of things that they like to use. Just like you would, you know, you would use on Google Chrome or something like that. Um, yeah, that's sort of like how I see things developing like longer term is this sort of like web of interconnected applications that all sort of fill different needs. Yeah, I, I totally agree there. And I think, you know, speaking in part from the inter protocol perspective, um, but just any application, they they all will need to integrate these kinds of, of front end tools like the skip API to be able to do asset routing. So, you know, for example, inter protocol did that through uh, leap elements because what we were seeing was folks didn't necessarily know how to get the assets to the inter protocol, you know, to the Agoric chain uh, for use in the inter protocol application. And, you know, IBC.fun is like, a, it's a really great example of how these things work, but, you know, every single application needs to fix this UX problem to keep their users from having to bounce around. And so having having an abstracted away API that you can just integrate is, is so, so valuable. And, you know, I think everyone's going to independently come to this conclusion, um, you know, sometime in the next year or so, if they haven't already, is my pretty, that's my view anyway. Awesome. So thank you both. Yeah. So I, I want to, 
do a slight transition a little bit into arguably one of the biggest use cases in crypto being stable coins. Um, we've got we've got Helena of Noble here and, and Zucky, um, the sommelier and, and Roland, you obviously teed up in a protocol a bit here. Um, do we have you both here, Zucky and Helena? I think we do. Yeah, I'm here. Hi, guys. Hey, how's it going? I'm here. Cool, cool. Thank you both for joining. Um, cool, thank you. So, you know, a, a question. I, so maybe, maybe Helena, let's start with you. You, know, I would love a high level description of uh, of Noble, um, and and also understanding how how Noble is thinking about this kind of, you know, arguably more more complex but, <laughs> um, also simplified UX space, right? You know, how, how are you thinking of the use cases for Noble, and and how are those um you know, those use cases come going into the design space thinking that your team is doing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, thanks for having me. So um, as Magnus was mentioning, uh, we obviously have a, a lot of kind of mind share and users and liquidity on uh, blockchains such as Ethereum and, you know, L2s um, like Arbitrum and these monolithic blockchains have always had this like incredible sort of a benefit, which is uh, native uh, li stablecoin liquidity, right? If you look at like the liquidity of something like USDC, the majority of it uh, is on Ethereum. Uh, it's partially because uh, Ethereum is obviously, you know, uh, was the first programmable blockchain to exist, uh, second blockchain to ever exist after Bitcoin. But um, also just because you have all these like applications like Uniswap and Curve and, and others that source their um, liquidity uh, natively uh, on the Ethereum uh, uh, chain. Uh, and so, you know, because you have this native access liquidity, you can build all these like cool applications and, you know, go to market quickly and so on and so forth. So that's the benefit of a monolithic chain from the perspective of native stablecoin liquidity. But when you're building in a environment like Cosmos, where every, every chain, every L1 is technically um, sovereign and independent from from the next, uh, it's a lot harder to uh, source this liquidity uh, in a native fashion. And so um, the way that this, ha this has been solved for sort of uh, up until now has been bridge stable coins. So before Noble existed, you know, the main way to sort of get stables into Cosmos, you know, to various Cosmos chains was via an Ethereum bridge like Axelar, which uh, poses just a whole lot of problems for you know, UX and um, security and, fr and, and fr from, the, from a developer's perspective. And so we uh, sought to build Noble to solve for, for, for this challenge in this sovereign context, in the sovereign app chain context, where you can have this one chain, which is Noble, that is fully interoperable, fully, um, you know, fully connected to the rest of the app chain uh, ecosystem and any chain developer, whether that's uh, Osmosis or Agoric or someone building on top of Agoric or, or anywhere else, they can simply source the liquidity, um, you know, from Noble. So it's, it's, so it's this like central kind of mechanism for this minting, for this burning, for this redeem, re redemptions, but you can source it easily uh, over IBC, which is uh, just a really easy way to, to do uh, kind of native bridging in Cosmos. And so Noble is pretty much trying to recreate this environment that you have um, on other on other monolithic uh, on monolithic chains, where you do have this like central point of uh, native issuance of something like a USDC of something like a stablecoin, but in in, a, in an app chain kind of modular context where obviously there is no native kind of base layer to source from, unlike you know uh, in ETH and uh, you know in the L2 world. So. That's our. That's kind of our, you know, our our raison to etra, and we're just uh, building towards that. Got it. Great. Yeah, Zucky, is there anything you wanna you wanna add there um, on that topic? Would would love to hear your thoughts as well, and kind of what what you're doing. So, I think like one of the I think one of the things that like Noble is really demonstrating is I mean I think there was a lot of skepticism around this idea that like oh, is a asset issuance an app? Um, and I think that, like, the, you know, Noble's focus on asset issue. So, like, we right now we have, like, two chains, I think, that, like, are in many ways, like, focused on asset issuance. Like, Stride is a great example of a chain that is, like, aggressively focusing on asset issuance, and Noble is a chain of that is, like, aggressively focusing on asset issuance. Um, and the like the reality thus far has been that like this model of b 
being very focused on asset issuance on like has like outperformed all other forms of asset issuance like uh you know and like you could even like go so far as to say like that's what the cosmos hub is doing too with adam is it just focused on like issuing this asset and like that and like issuing this assets distributing the asset uh, you know trying to grow uses of the asset you know it this is actually a quite powerful model for um integrating liquidity where i think smart contracts come in is where you're really like extending the power of 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 the assets so like you know you have what so like inner protocol which is living on the like agoric general purpose chain is like extending like what you can do with uh uh liquid staked assets like the majority of the collateral is liquid staked assets um it per participates in a liquidity network that is like primarily powered by noble usdc we've seen like the adoption across all cosmos dexes of noble usdc as like the primary like liquidity routing layer that most assets get routed through and this like actually forms a very like coherent picture um, that allows you to do like very sophisticated things like, you know, now you can have this world in which like all of this stuff is actually quite composable. And so like you can, you know, you could take your, you know, atom position, liquid stake it uh, uh, and like, you know, yield farm the like uh, stride Tia airdrop by like building up a, a Tia position with your IST. Um, you can do like all of this. Um, like there are a lot of different ways in which you can uh, compose these pieces together. You can, you know, liquid stakes, uh, you could have like a, a calc finance strategy that is automatically selling your uh, validator rewards, but hold them as ST Atom and have it routed, you know, into USDC or IST or any other stable coin uh, in a fairly seamless manner. Like the composability that's actually achievable in Cosmos today is really extraordinary. What I don't think we have in as, as like all of the examples is, is this like strong culture of using that composability. The other problem is, is that like accessing all of this composability is a lot of clicks, is a lot of implicit knowledge, a lot. And I think like what chain abstraction is about, is about like trying to like essentially deliver a user experience to this user where developers have to know all of these details. Like, oh, I'm putting together all of these different app chains and applications across a whole complex multi-chain liquidity network. But a user is just like, I would like yield. I would like leverage. I would like X and like the network. And we should build systems that can just deliver that for us. Um, and I guess that's a lot of what like we built, what like SOM has been building for the last, uh, you know, uh, almost three years at this point, um, which is like, you know, we and we do this on Ethereum and we do this on L2s. Um, and we are, uh, uh, we've, you know, we recently expanded to L2s using Axor GMP. And like, it's exactly this idea. Like we want to give people a simple user experience where people are like, I would like yield on their, my asset. No, I do not know how Uniswap V3 works. No, I do not know the intricacies of the liquid staking token market. No, I do not know like whether or not this, like whether or not this yield farm is safe. No, I do not know what Athena is. I just, like want to hold an asset and I want to earn the best yield possible on it. Um, and uh, SOM has been delivering that infrastructure and it has been steadily growing through the bull in the through the bear market and has now grown, you know, quite a bit in the bull market. Uh, but it is, you know, that opportunity and like, you know, it's like people are also willing to, pay, you know, essentially pay for this. Like SOM strategists have made millions on the on the platform. Uh, some stakers are generating hundreds of thousands of dollars a month in or like about a hundred thousand dollars a month in real yield. Uh, it's, it's, it's like, this is like a really important application ca category. It's really powerful. It's really valuable. And, and, and in some ways, is it, is it what Sam has done has kind of unlocked a very intricate backend process and simplified it for the user. Is that, is that an accurate way of kind of, you know, yeah, like, I mean, like, what SOM strategies do is, like, very sophisticated, right? Like, we, like, the strategy will go out, it will, like, take out a position on a lending protocol like Aave, it will refinance that lending protocol if there's liquidity on a protocol like Morpho, it will, 
uh, use flash loans to like uh, in a gas efficient way, like lever up your position. It will uh, like it will do all kinds of stuff. It will manage Uniswap tick ranges. You know, this protocol has been the largest liquidity provider for wrapped staked ETH uh, on ETH mainnet for, you know, almost a year. Um, these are like all very, very sophisticated things. Um, and, you know, if like DeFi for users, like we want users to be their own bank, but with with like software automation and abstraction under the hood. So they don't actually have to like uh, like run a bank. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, no, thanks to that one. <laughs> go, go ahead, Roland. And if you had a comment, yeah, I, you know, I, I see it as sort of like there will probably there will be a range of these services, right? And so for users that think they can do better on their own, they will always have the opportunity. But you know, you will have. I think one of the other things that was like really my co-founder Christie's vision with Sommelier, which I think is really important about like this all this chain abstraction stuff is. Like, Similia uses quite a lot of Cosmos tech under the hood. Um, but if you interact with the app, it is somewhat abstracted for you. Now, we're, we're like, starting to build out, you know, like, the point is not to make Cosmos invisible. In fact, we have lots of, we, we're definitely working on a bunch of stuff right now that will sort of leverage the Cosmos side more. And, like, now the Cosmos side is doing regular auctions and stuff like that. It's not to make these things invisible, but, like, if you are an Ethereum DeFi user, you should be able to interact with things feeling like, oh, I'm just like living in Ethereum or I'm living on Arbitrum or I'm living on another L2. But like you should have the entire multi-chain ecosystem at your disposal. I love that. No, that's great. And, and so maybe, Helena, going back to Noble, you know, I, I, we talked about um, asset issuance. Like how does Noble think about its kind of proliferation across all of these potential use cases, both, you know, uh, you know, I guess primarily in Cosmos, but also kind of through extensibility to these other ecosystems. Yeah, I mean, our focus is really to uh, standardize like a lot of the processes around uh, how we do things like cross-chain communication and interoperability between app chains and in the future, uh, even the roll-up ecosystem. So one thing that we built um, is uh, the Cosmos standard for the cross-chain uh, transfer protocol. So this is uh, lives, uh, Noble is uh, one of the partners to this CCTP protocol, which pretty much allows any user to natively burn and mint uh, USDC uh, between any CCTP supported chain, which includes right now Ethereum, Arbitrum, Optimism, Avalanche, Base, and Noble, and next week will actually be Solana. So that means I can like natively go from my USDC on Solana to my USDC on Noble um, in a like one click, like capital efficient fashion. And the reason we did that is because it just like makes the most intuitive sense, like from like a standardization perspective. Like if you are bridging something like USDC, like there's really no reason now to do like a wrapped version or a mint, you know, a, like a lock and mint bridge uh, or use anything like this because you now have the most capital efficient bridge, which is CCTP doing that native uh, native um, bridging for you. And so that's like no, no, Noble's uh, mission, like align on these standards. Like we definitely have taken a big bet on like specific standards. One of those being CCTP, another one of those of course being IBC. Um, and so that's really uh, like our mission for like other other native assets, like ha like making sure we're kind of exporting that model to 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 other assets as well. I saw the other day that uh, you guys announced that you're going to be a roll app and post data to Celestia. I'm curious how that how that sort of fits into your vision. Yeah, um, Noble Noble is interesting because we're an app chain. Um, we have actually a lot of flexibility on how we um, we we like kind of evolve like i think um i mean a lot, a lot of people that like build in the cosmos ecosystem like will resonate with this like the stack itself is like highly flexible modular everything from you know tenderman and abci plus plus to ibc to the sdk um so one of the things that we're looking at is obviously um we're, we we are we are keen on on uh uh, data availability like as as a as a product as like a as or rather more like a service to, to for noble um so obviously like in cosmos already it's like relatively cheap to have the validators kind of um um being that like 
like data availability layer, but we see kind of plugging into the Celestia data, data availability layer as one way we can like more easily service um, Celestia rollups with like native uh, assets such as USDC. So it's still, uh, it, we're still in the beginning phases of like scoping this out, but just from like a data perspective, um, you know, um, Celestia is something that we're interested in. It's less so on the security aspect itself. Uh, right now we're actually a proof of authority chain. So like our actual consensus mechanism in terms of, you know, how um, validators produce blocks and how we have like, you know, certain trust trust assumptions, that's all actually on the POA side of things. And, and, and this will not change as we do Celestia uh, DA. Um, so like we're, we're almost like um, evolving the noble consensus in like a step-by-step -step fashion where we're currently noble POA, we will be doing DA, but we still actually have like another step to go towards like actual economic security, which, um, you know, stay tuned on, on kind of the updates there. But um, yeah, uh, just plugging into this Celestia DA ecosystem is just like another way for us to like ultimately like service like rollups and uh, it's just a cheaper form of like posting data than is currently available. So that's the TLDR. Awesome. Yeah. So, so, you know, we, we've talked a bit about, you know, staking, we've talked about stable coins, you know, one of the other things that, that I'd love to cover, you know, in this kind of cross chain multi-chain discussion is um, our vaults, right? So the, the, the concept of being able to lock an asset um, uh, into a vault that, you know, can fundamentally run or deploy, I guess, you know, auto compounding strategies, um, you know, Within a protocol, obviously vaults are, are a big component of actually minting the IST stable token. Um, and I think Anil, we also have you here. Uh, I know you guys are working on uh, NFT rentals uh, with Crabble. I, I'm curious, you know, and, and this is kind of for all the speakers, but if anyone, you know, feel free to chime in here, you know, how, you know, how do vaults go multi-chain, right? And like, how do they, you know, start to expand and what opportunities are there across different ecosystems for vaults that, Again, are trying to be user friendly, <laughs> um, and Zaki, I think you touched yeah. a bit on this, but I'm, I'm curious from you know previous or, or, or new speakers on on you know how do we start looking at at the expanding landscape of vaults and what's possible here? Uh, yeah, like for the uh, NFT point of view, like uh, how we as like Crabble we plan to use vaults is to actually make for make the like rented nft uh, market more liquid because like uh, within the given model like the when you want to rent an nft uh, what's going to happen is that the protocol has to manage the risk of the borrower not returning the nft itself in the case where we are actually transferring the uh, nft to the borrower from the protocol so uh which actually like in order to make some kind of risk management here you have to use like as usual a collateral where that actually kind of limits the uh, liquidity of and the number of uh, the transaction volume on the uh, protocol basically because people have might not have the like enough collateral where the owner of the nft actually thinks that nft is worth x amount y amount i don't know but uh, how we like try to use vaults in this case is like like that's one part of it like the, the collateral side of things uh, the risk management side of things and the other side of things like when you think about the nft space like every uh network out there has its own valuable NFTs or has its own NFTs that has its hype or whatever. And where we like, what, when we look at the future of the NFTs, like we, we kind of need some utility attached to, to those NFTs to actually uh, increase the adoption of the like idea. So when we think about it like uh the, one of the biggest reasons why someone actually lands an nft like borrows an nft is like they have to be able to do something with that asset so and the multi-chain vaults here actually uh, like we kind of think it answers these uh, problems the, both of these problems very well is that let's imagine like uh, you have a like a media content living on Omniflix and 
uh, you will be actually doing some kind of gated uh, entrance into the, uh, I don't know, the video stream or whatever. So, and I only want to join the event one time and I don't want to actually buy the whole NFT, you know, and the NFT itself is on Omniflix and I'm going to go it. So uh, at this point, like uh, what we are doing is we actually use an ICA to use as a uh, vault where the owner of the NFT like sends their uh, assets into that ICA account and then over Crabble, I mean, over the application on Agoric, they uh, say that we want to land this. And how we do here, what we do here is that we get rid of the collateralization phase because we, as, as the, like the protocol has the uh, asset locked in a vault on the remote chain and like we transfers and all of that also as the protocol like we know the nft is here and for those uh, other protocols who are integrated into this kind of uh, product will know that the utility of the nft can be exercised but as the like travel protocol we don't need to take on the risk of actually sending the asset to the borrower th themselves so Actually, using the orchestration API, we kind of both solve the liquidity problem of the uh, lending NFT, NF rental NFTs market, and also we kind of uh, be able, we are able to make use of the uh, all the assets living at all over the networks who are connected to this multi-chain world. Got it. And and maybe there's a question for 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 you and Neil as well as maybe Roland and Zaki on you know more on the IST side of things too. Like where you know, I'm a, I'm a basic user. Like, why can't I just use any collateral <laughs> in vaults to get this asset or this utility asset that I want to use for something else? Um, why can't you just use any collateral? So I think for a stable coin, what is really important is like liquidity and demand. Um, like the, uh, like there is this sort of where you can think of, of stablecoin protocols as kind of, you know, related to the concept of lending protocols, but um, sort of like they exist at the higher at like the top level of the hierarchy of um, of 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 uh, collateral requirements. Right. You can you you sort of need to uh, you, in order to maintain stability, like. I think uh, IST has like scaled a uh, total amount of collateral, you know, by about five X in the this year um, and, uh, you know, s continued to be really stable. Um, and there's like lots of interesting flows and arbitrages that like uh, that, like people need to be engaging in in order to do that and can really only make those flows and arbitrages work um, for really liquid assets. Um, uh, um, and then the. Um, and then the like other side of it is um, is so like then you want to have like lending protocols that take less liquid collateral um, and can like and and you know offer like yield for that underlying stablecoin uh, and like this is this is sort of the flywheel that like allows for decentralized stablecoins like IST to grow. Yeah, if we if we look at sort of um you know the the topic of this which is which is vaults the the connection i see between um the the byte pitch project crabble that anil has been talking about and you know for example inter protocol is the idea that in this multi-chain design space you can you can do cross-chain locking which allows you to have some interesting ux and capabilities so um you know in in crabble's case it's they can lock remote nfts so you don't need to transfer the nft over ibc the protocol can own the nft through ownership of the ica um, and that unlocks a bunch of capabilities for them for something like inter protocol cross-chain locking lets you both sort of improve ux so for example you could have you could have an extension to vaults that locks assets on a remote chain and then mints ist directly to that chain so that the user from their perspective never has to really do any of this um, 
you know, front end movement of, of assets to mint and then move IST back, they just feel like they're sitting on their, you know, whatever application they're already using. And then suddenly, you know, they've got a widget that lets them create a vault and get IST immediately. Um, or you can start to do things that um, actually aren't really possible with IBC right now. So, you know, imagine you have a position on a remote chain that is pretty complex. And so I think like, you know, a concentrated LP position on osmosis. I think right now you, you can't transfer that over IBC, but you could ensure that the, the protocol owns it. And then that would be something that could potentially be used as collateral, um, obviously sort of subject to the kinds of limitations that Zucky was just talking about. But that's where I start to get really excited around, the, you know, the ability of, of do, you know, extending things like inter-protocol with multi-chain capabilities. Awesome. That's great. Yeah. Is there, is there anything else folks want to add to that uh, from our speakers? I don't know if, if Magnus or, or John go for it. Yeah. I mean, with Calypso, you know, we could set it up so that, I mean, it like the, the type of collateral that's provided into an IST vault, you know, it could be set as a default. So say if you want to provide, I don't know, token A to bolster the liquidity of token B, um, it doesn't matter what token you have to start with, it can always end up at token A on that vault with something like a Calypso. And I think that's how we get these multi-chain vaults and other similar products to grow. You know, the people who actually create the vaults, they can set their parameters, whatever the heck they want as a default. So if you want an IST vault fully backed with, with build in it, you can make it so that no matter what currency you're starting with, it'll always end up providing build into that vault. So I don't know, just a little Calypso plug there, but that's kind of something about how I personally think multi-chain vaults are gonna expand. I feel like there's some like interesting mech design things that we could probably work on. We meaning like Cosmos. Um, like one of the things that I've been thinking about like recently is, you know, just like the fact that we have like huge overlapping validator sets in Cosmos and therefore have like these very strong implicit shared trust assumptions between them. Like in some ways, like at the end of the day, like Cosmos is essentially just the same validators running like different binaries, right? Um, and if you can like leverage that fact um, of like the shared overlapping validator sets, uh, you can start to like make like really interesting like potential security guarantees that could be important for things like, you know, like cross-chain collateralization so like, for example, let's say I have like USDC on Noble, right? And I like lock it into something. Um, like if I, if, if the validator set is like heavily shared with a different chain, like let's call it, you know, I don't know, DYDX or, or something like it, something else. If like that shared validator set attests to that lock, then like perhaps I can like um, take out uh, like a loan against it, knowing that like, uh, there's like a there's like a commitment to sort of like slashing that locked amount if let's say I you know liquid get liquidated or or you know use that loan for something that like or, or like I no longer you know like that loan needs to be like requisitioned by someone um, or like retaken by someone um, I don't know like I feel like there's like a lot of there's a lot of primitives that could be built for something like this that like would further enhance sort of like the interoperability of Cosmos because I do think it would be so sweet as like a next step to sort of have this experience of it doesn't really matter where my tokens are, they can be used as collateral anywhere, right? Um, on any vault or on any other, you know, protocol. Um, and I don't have to move things to like, you know, the, the actual destination where the application is. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and, you know, from from the Agoric side, as we're starting to to push into some of this on chain composability across across Cosmos and beyond, um, you know, one of the things we're we're ramping up to do is to start sort of pushing new requirements into IBC. So in particular, um, getting notifications on balances for ICA accounts, things like that, that, you know, it, it's little stuff that's kind of in the in the details of, of development from a lot of people's perspective, but that is holding back a lot of capability. And so, you know, I'm, I'm excited over the next few months as we start to get those things in and then, you know, would love to talk about how how sort of we could 
to take advantage of overlapping validator sets too, because that was a dimension I didn't really have in my mind of, of how we might be able to, to push things forward. Yeah, Noma's done some really interesting work just to shout them out, um, thinking about sort of like how this like like a shared quorum of validators can actually give you some really interesting like cross-chain composability guarantees. Um, I think the concept there is like chimera chains, which you know I don't think are talked about enough. Um, but probably some kind of scaled down version of that uh, that leverages sort of like cross-chain slashable commitments between two separate chains to do something like, you know, uh, like guaranteed lockups um, and that would allow sort of like a collateralization on, on a different chain like would be would be really interesting to explore. That's interesting. Would, would the collateral end up being less than what's needed because of that guarantee or, or maybe how does that affect the user? Yeah, so like the desired UX, I think, would be, you know, I have USDC, right? I want to be able to access all this. Stuff. Like, I want to be able to take loans out. I want to be able to, like, you know, open perps positions. I want to be able to sort of, you know, get exposure to a vault. Um, so essentially, like, that USDC needs to be, like, slashable or not necessarily not, slashable is not the right word, but, like, sort of, like, redeemable by these protocols right. that you're depositing into, right? Um, and so... I think what you need to do is you need to create this like cross chain commitment where essentially one chain is essentially promising the other chain saying, okay, if you tell me that this like money is now in jeopardy, like I will give you it. Like I will send it to you over IBC mm. or something like that. Right. Um, and I think there's like a lot of different ways that that commitment could be structured, but I think there's like an interesting space of like, if you share a validator set, um, and the, the shared set of validators can attest to that commitment, then if that commitment is broken, um, then that shared validator set can sort of like, uh, you know, the worst case is like halt the chain um, or, you know, perhaps like essentially bond themselves to this promise such that like they would be on the hook or something like that. It's essentially sort of like a complicated restaking primitive, right? Where basically like, uh, you could you could like offer this experience and like put validators on the line for for doing this kind of thing and maybe there's like a slashable event if the commitment is broken but perhaps also like that is so worthwhile uh to the user that like there's additional yield involved for those validators who do attest to that commitment um i just think more needs to be like thought about uh in this space of the fact that the reality that all cosmos chains are secured by similar validators and like, therefore, there's actually a shared trust assumption. There's a shared trust assumption already existing between chains, um, and you can leverage that to like make Cosmos more composable, right? In like a very real way. Of course, there's like some mech design involved, but like it's very attainable, and it already like the the basics already exist. Yeah, that's really that's really interesting. I hadn't considered that. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, I mean, I wonder I wonder what kind of, um, you know end user facing applications that could unlock that are maybe too difficult to build otherwise or not even possible. That's an interesting one to explore actually. Yeah, I, the way I see this is it, it, it may take a Cosmos SDK view of some of what Agoric is trying to do at the orchestration layer via smart contracts. And, and I sort of wonder where the overlap is and where the like additional capability is. And I think definitely would want to explore that a lot because it, it feels like we could either get speed increases, notification increases, like commitment increases. There's, there's a lot of things that it could possibly provide. Um, so the challenge would be you'd have to, you know, as you're moving across many chains, the, the overlap and validator sets may vary across them and, um we need to think that through yeah and i think like the way that these things start is usually very simple right so like there, there's probably a bunch of people who uh their desire for where they use an application is fully separate from their desire of where to place their funds right so you could think of like someone who only trusts cctp right and only wants to go over cctp and therefore is comfortable going to noble but is not comfortable going to anywhere else Right. And maybe or, or just like, you know, in the future version, like or in a future version, just wants to keep their money on uh, Ethereum, for example. Um, that is that might be completely separate from their desire to, like, gain exposure or or use different applications in the ecosystem. 
So maybe they don't feel comfortable sending all of their money over to whatever it is, let's say call it like BYDX, for example, because they don't trust their validator set or just because they have some you know, legal restriction where they can only really have money on one chain, but they still want to take out positions or they still want to like use those protocols and gain like exposure to whatever, or, or just, you know, like, like make use of whatever uh, functionality they have. I think, I, I think that's sort of what you'd be unlocking here, right? So it's like two chains come to some kind of agreement where, you know, like I think a very natural one here might be like Noble and DYDX, where you can hold collateral on Noble and then you can take out positions based on that collateral on DYDX, right? Um, and I think that would be really sick, right? And then you can start to expand that by sort of like building more bilateral commitments between these chains, just like IBC expanded, right? Uh, which is just like a bilateral commitment between two sets of validators. In this case, it would have to be a shared set of validators to sort of like uh, build these cross-chain primitives um, to allow for this like seamless cross-chain collateralization. Um, and I, I just think that would be sick, right? Like you can use your money anywhere in Cosmos as like value for any other application. Like, I feel like that's a, that, that's a, that's a big accomplishment if we could get to something like that. Well, we should chat more because I, I think a lot of this <laughs> is what we're driving towards with orchestration and what we hope to be able to do via smart contracts and ICAs without the, without the validator set. But, um, yeah, let, let's, let's keep talking. Yeah. Cool. I well, mean, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, like, you know, for, from my perspective, like, I, I think from a very, you know, UX standpoint, and it's like, you just need to make these things easy and accessible. Um, I think you, it, it doesn't really matter always like how it's implemented necessarily. And like, I think what you want to do with these kinds of things is you do want to sort of like have an air of like, or, or have a approach of, um, what's the right word, like non competition, so to speak. Right. So like, you know, if, if we're going to build really good primitives to make Cosmos more interoperable, I think you have to build these things in a way where like, you know, it not only helps one chain, but it helps like multiple different chains. Right. And like really, really can serve as like a baseline primitive in the same way that like the Cosmos SDK is viewed as, viewed as like helping one chain. Um, yeah, this is like the space where like I like to think about a lot because I truly believe in like the expansion of L1s as like an alternative path for how chains are built and like building these kinds of things is like directly in the in like the path to to making that happen well yeah interesting interesting conversation that that thank you magnus um i i want to be uh cautious with folks time is um you know maybe a, a question to to all the speakers what do you what are you kind of most excited for in the uh, multi-chain design space this year and maybe john we can start with you uh, Calypso's contract going live <laughs> on Agoric Mainnet in any day now. I'm very excited for that. Um, I'm also excited for the capabilities it's going to enable between EVM and Cosmos and Solana and everything else that comes with it. So, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. How about, how about you, Anil? Yeah. Uh, Person personally, like uh, to integrate this orchestration API into our own uh, smart contracts, uh, and also like explore the other like features of this orchestration API, like managing a like an agoric account using a smart contract, which like ha has its own use cases that I can think of, and I just want to really explore all those. Uh, all those APIs in the SDK, like I'm looking forward to. Yeah. Awesome. How about you, Zaki? What I am excited about is I think the frontier is going to be when people realize you don't, as an application, you don't have to be either like a one chain or one ecosystem application. and You don't have to be an L1 and you can still launch a token. And so I guess I'm, I'm, uh, I'm excited for like the coming wave of chain abstracted tokens to come to come with the coming wave of chain abstracted applications. Awesome. Uh, and how about how about you, uh, Magnus? What are you most looking forward to this year? Well, I'm very curious about this orchestration stuff. I don't think I've looked into it before. Um, so I'd love to hear more about that. It sounds really cool. Uh, I mean, outside of that. Um, 
what am I interested about? Uh, I think like I'm very interested to see sort of the intersection of sort of the modular world and and cosmos. I'm curious to see what like a lot of folks are a lot of outside folks are like getting more interested in sort of supporting cosmos core functions like security via like ethos, um, you know, data availability, obviously with like Celestia. And I'm curious to see sort of like the intersection of the, those two things. Um, I think like Cosmos has a lot to teach the modular ecosystem in terms of stuff we've already solved in terms of what it looks like to have a bunch of different state layers and interoperate between them. Um, and also I think like validator sets are important in many situations and we can help rollups like build more powerful applications. We also think like rollups are going to be very exciting for Cosmos once they're IBC enabled and just bring a lot more users and, you know, uh, applications into the ecosystem with a lot lower barrier of entry. So that like, that collaboration, I think, is is very exciting to me. Awesome, awesome, and I think uh, Roland, I think we have you back here. Uh, we yeah, were asking um, earlier, what folks are most excited for this year in terms of the kind of multi chain expansion? Yeah, and, and you know, just selfishly, I'm I'm excited about the orchestration APIs going live. So you know, that's going to be uh, allowing people to build Agoric smart contracts with um, straightforward ways to create, manage ICAs um, to make you know, IBC transactions, do, um, you know, uh, PFM transactions, all sorts of stuff uh, from a, a Cosmos composability standpoint. And and so, you know, we're launching with sort of uh, the most limited set of capabilities we can, but then we're going to very quickly expand to, you know, supporting rollups, supporting, you know, ecosystems beyond uh, Cosmos and just excited to see what people build once they realize they can compose across Cosmos chains. Um, so, you know, looking for all the opportunities we can to, to get the word out and, and get people coming to coming to build. So excited about that. Amazing. Amazing. Well, once again, thank you. Thank you all the speakers and the uh, attendees of this multi-chain design space. We're, uh, we're going to be doing a lot more conversations like this um, over the next few weeks and months around, you know, looking at the expanding nature of cross-chain and multi-chain across different ecosystems. Um, so again, thank you, everybody. Uh, you can follow Gork at Ada Gork, um, and we will have this uh, this call up on YouTube uh, probably by tomorrow. We'll share that as well. So, if folks want to share that with their communities, you're totally welcome to. Uh, and yeah, be on the lookout for more of these spaces. Again, thanks, thanks, speakers. Uh, always a pleasure. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>